Welcome to the last presentation in our series of fake news. Our message is entitled, Draining of the Swamp. Let's pray. Father, as we come to a close, as we open your word once more, I ask, Lord, that you may teach us, that you may reveal to us truths as taught in your word. Is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. During the campaigns which took place recently, the Republican frontrunner kept bringing attention to what he called, as we mentioned earlier, the lying media and the dishonest press. And if elected, he promised that, that he would do something in Washington, D.C., that he would drain the swamp. He said that there was too many career politicians who cared nothing about the people and, and just wanted to get reelected over and over and over again. He said that swamp monsters were ruining America from the great potential that it has. And he promised that he would drain the swamp, and by doing so, he was going to make America great again. Well, since then, the front runner, Donald Trump, has become President Donald Trump. And during the first year of, of his presidency, we have seen 15 people in his administration who were either fired or resigned. <laughs> Indeed, dr draining the swamp. Also, we have seen over 20 people working in other agencies such as the FBI and CIA, over 20 employees fired in just the first six months of his presidency. Indeed, draining the swamp. And many Americans were shouting for joy that, that the swamp was being drained. Now, in our last presentation, we saw that God has set up and that he has raised up the Adventist church to simply represent him and to reveal his character to the world. In other words, we are, we are God's media outlet and God's press corps. We saw earlier that God has set up an organization to represent him here on earth. Notice what, what Ellen White says regarding this organization. She says, God has ordained that the representatives of his church from all parts of the earth when assembled in a general conference shall have authority. Hmm. God says that when his church is, is represented from all parts of the world, all parts of the globe, that when assembled in a general conference, his church shall have authority. And then she says, God has bestowed the highest power under heaven upon his church. It is the voice of God, she says, in his united people in church capacity, which is to be respected. So Ellen White says that, that when the church is united, when it's, when it's together as one, it is the voice of God. So we see clearly that God indeed has a church. But not everyone in God's church will be saved. In fact, the majority who are currently in God's remnant church will leave when push comes to shove. When final events begin to transpire, many in God's church will leave. They won't be able to stand during this time called the shaking. When, when persecution comes our way, many in the, in the Adventist church today will leave during the time of the shaking. Now, I want you to notice some statements that, that Ellen White has to say regarding the shaking. She says here, last day events, page 173, divisions will come in the church, two parties will be developed. Have we, have we seen that today? Absolutely. Two parties will be developed. The wheat and the tares grow together, she says. There will be a shaking of the, of the sieve. The chaff must in time be separated from the wheat because iniquity abounds, she says. The love of many waxes cold. It is a very time when the genuine will be the strongest. We are told that a shaking is upon God's church, that a shaking is upon God's people. Now, you know, we often ask, ask the question, okay, we know of a coming shaking, but what really does, what really is this shaking? What's it about? What does it consist of? 
what is the shaking? Well, well, Ellen White actually had the same exact question. And so she actually asked her, her angel, she says this, I asked the meaning of the shaking. This is from Christian Experience and Teachings, page 176. She says, I asked the meaning of the shaking and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the, the, the Laodiceans. And then she continues. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it. And this is what will cause a shaking among God's people. So Ellen White here is very, very clear what causes the shaking among God's people. She says it is the straight testimony, the undiluted gospel, God's truth for these end times. The straight testimony is what causes the sifting, the shaking among God's people. And then she says here, some will not be able to bear this testimony. They will rise up against it, which means those who were once in the faith are now opposing the faith and rising up against this straight testimony. And she says, this is what will cause the shaking among God's people. So what causes the shaking? What causes the swamp to be drained? The straight testimony as called forth, she says, by the counsel of the witness to the Laodiceans. Now, what counsel was called forth by the Laodiceans? Well, let's turn in our Bibles to Revelation 3 again as we saw in our, first, in our first lecture. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 16, the Bible tells us exactly what that straight testimony was. Verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot, but because you are lukewarm, I will spew thee out of my mouth. So God's call is for his people to take a side in the last days. He calls for his people to make a choice, not to sit on the fence, but to choose a side. Are you going to follow me or not? Make up your mind. The same call was given in the Elijah message of Malachi 4. The same call is, was, was given by Elijah himself. Let's turn to 1 Kings 18. 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21. What call did Elijah give? You see, at this time in Israel's history, a very terrible king was ruling. His name was Ahab. Had a horrible wife who was crowned queen, and her name was Jezebel. And Israel at this time, unfortunately, was worshiping foreign gods, a god named Baal. And there were actual prophets of Baal in Israel, funded by Israel. And Elijah... One prophet of God, the true God, Jehovah, comes and battles the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. Notice here we are in verse 21. And Elijah says, And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long halt ye between what? Two opinions. If the Lord be God, then follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. So Elijah gives a call in his day to take a stand, to make a choice. Are you going to follow God? Are you going to follow someone else? A false god, Baal. And the Bible says that the people answered him, not a word. You know, by saying nothing is saying something. Isn't that right? By saying nothing is saying something. Those that day who said nothing took a stand and followed Baal. And we see the results of Israel's rebellion, captivity, captivity, this cycle of rebellion going away from God. Elijah's call was to simply make a choice, take a stand. And God is calling for his people in these last days 
to also take a stand. Who will we follow? God or Baal? God or Babylon? Do you realize, or I should first say, uh, first say that there are too many people in God's church today who are afraid to take a stand. There are lots of people who come to me with all their frustrations. Oh, I'm so sad that the church is doing this, and I, I, I can't believe that, that so-and-so is doing this in God's church. And I ask them, well, what have you done about it? Oh, nothing. Nothing. The call that God gives is to take a stand for truth. If you see error happening right before your very eyes, if error is happening in your own church, take a stand. And God will honor that stand, but take a stand nonetheless. There are too many people who are afraid to voice their concerns when they see something happening in the church which should not be happening. Instead of grumbling, let's take a stand. And do something about it. What do you say, amen? Let's do something about all the problems in God's church today. Do you realize in Adventism, who has the power? Who has the power in Adventism? Many folks think, oh, here here in our local conference, it's the president. Wrong answer. No, he doesn't. Our church is built upon a representative system, which means the people have the power in this church. Do you realize that a church business meeting decision outweighs a conference decision? The local level has more power in this church. Our church was built upon a representative system. The people have the power. If you would simply come together and voice your opinions, things will change because power lies in the laity of this church. You notice in our church, when it comes to church policies and, and, and church structure, how do, we, how, how do we elect conference officials? Well, the church, each church in the conference, elects members to sit on an organizing committee. And this organizing group then elects members to sit on a nominating committee for the conference. And this group which nominates, nominates the president, secretary, treasurer, and members of the executive committee. And their recommendations then go to the church at large in a constituency meeting. And churches, members represented from all churches in the conference vote. Which means the power lies with the local people. The power lies with the laity. And God in these last days is calling for his people to take a stand for truth. Do not be afraid to stand for truth. Though it isn't popular, though you receive persecution, take a stand for truth. And God will honor that stand. Now, I, I want to repeat a quote which I read in some previous uh, lectures. This comes from Christ Object Lessons, page 415. Ellen White says, the last message of mercy to be given to the world, once again, is what? A revelation of God's character of love. Of love. She says, the children of God are to manifest his glory. Beloved, this is the closing work, the loud cry that, that goes forth. This is the sealing work. Now, in this last lecture, I want to focus on the sealing work. Let's, let's look at the sealing work. Let's turn to uh, Revelation 7 and notice what happens here in the 7th chapter of Revelation. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1. The Bible says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from where? The east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth or the sea 
or the trees, till we have did what? Seal the servants of God in their foreheads. Seal the servants of God. This angel comes down and says, guys, don't let go until my people are sealed. So here we see four angels, and they're holding the four winds. Now question, what happens if the angels let go of the winds? We saw it earlier. Strife, commotion, war. The Bible calls it the great time of trouble. And so these, these angels were about to let go. But right before they're about to let go, an angel flies in. Phew, stop. Don't let go. Why? Because my people are not sealed yet. The sealing work was put on hold. Christ's second coming was put on hold for God to finish his work of sealing his people in the last days. Do you realize, listen closely, do you realize that the four angels were about to let go of the four winds of the earth in the late 1800s? A message came to this church in 1888 a message called righteousness by faith. And the angels were excited. They're about to let go of the winds. Christ would have come then if our church had grabbed hold of that message. But instead, the brethren, Elder Butler, Elder Smith, all the brethren up there at the GC rejected the message. And guess what happened? Because of their rejection, Verse 2 had to happen. Because of their rejection, the angel had to fly in from the east and say, guys, stop. Don't let go yet. My people are not ready. God would finish his work in the 1880s. Christ would have come by 1890 if our church had grabbed hold of this message. You realize that, that if our church had accepted this message, World War I, World War II, all the world wars would have not taken place if our church had grabbed hold of this message. Nuclear bombs would, would not exist if our church had grabbed hold of this message. But praise the Lord that God in His mercy gave us time. Amen? God gives us time. And because of that, we're here today. We're here today. What happens next after the sealing work? Or I should say during the sealing work. Because you see, the sealing work takes place at the same time that a group of people rises forth. What group is that? Verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed a hundred and what? Forty-four thousand of all the tribes are the children of Israel. So the Bible says that God had to put his coming on a halt to seal his people, and those who are sealed, the Bible calls them the 144,000. Those who are sealed at the coming of Christ. Now what does it mean for them to be sealed? Sealed at the coming of Christ. You know, we, we right now, living in 2018, we are living right between verse 3 and 4. We are living right between those two verses. Verse 3, the angel comes and says, don't, don't touch them, hurt not the earth. Verse 4, the sealing of the 144,000. We are living in the time period, beloved, of the sealing work. God is currently sealing his people. He is currently sealing the 144,000. The sealing work of earth's history as depicted in Bible prophecy. Well, notice what Ellen White says regarding the sealing work in letter 30 in 1907. She says, before the work, which is a sealing work, is closed up and the sealing of God's people is finished, we shall receive, she says, the outpouring of the Spirit of God. Angels from heaven will be in our midst. Wow, what times to look forward to, huh? 
Angels from heaven will be in our midst, she says. The present is a fitting up time for heaven when we must walk in full obedience to all the commands of God. Those who are sealed, we're told, will be walking in full obedience to the commands of God. In other words, those who are sealed will have perfected Christian character. Now, what does Christ say in Matthew 5, 48? Let's turn there. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. What does Christ say? Christ speaks here. And this is, once again, the beginning of his Sermon on the Mount. And he's speaking here in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. Be ye therefore, what? Perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Christ says, if you want to make it to heaven, perfection is required. Now some say, wait a minute, you're teaching legalism. No, 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 no. Perfection can only take place with Christ in here. And the only per person who can perfect our characters is not us, but Christ who lives in us. Amen? It's Christ who lives and works in us. It's He who perfects our characters. But nonetheless, perfection is required for the inheritance of the kingdom. Now there are those today who say, no, no, no. That is absolutely impossible. Question, would God ask you to do something which you can't do? So if God tells you to be perfect, he's promising you that you can and will be perfect when he comes. The Bible says that, that Christ is coming for a church that's without spot or wrinkle. You know what that means? Perfect. Perfect. Now the word perfect scares some people. They think, oh, I have to stop doing it. I have, the focus is on me. As long as the focus is on you, on me, on the individual, you will never attain perfection. But the focus ought to be only on Christ Jesus, he who works in and through you. Because really, only he is perfect. And if he's living in here, and he's perfect. That makes my character perfect as well. It's this message of righteousness by faith. It can, it will be done only with the accompaniment of Christ in our heart. So the angels will not let go of the winds of strife. The time of trouble will not come. The Sunday law will not come. Mark of the beast will not come until God's People experience righteousness by faith in its fullness. We can look at the Vatican. We, we can look at America. Look at all these events being fulfilled, be, happening right now, right before our very eyes. But our focus ought to be on ourselves. Am I allowing God to do His work in me? No matter how much popes there are, until you and I, until God's church, until the Seventh-day Adventist church comes to the point where we begin to focus on a message called righteousness by faith, nothing will happen. We will be here for the next 50, 100 years. God is waiting for this church to grab hold of the message of righteousness by faith the message which he gave to us in 1888, a most precious message, a message of love, a message, a message that bids us to the foot of the cross and gives us prophecies for these last days, all included in this third angel, the loud cry, the message of righteousness by faith. Goes right along with a quote from, from Illinois where she says in Christ's Object Lessons, page 69, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. So who's waiting? Us? No. Christ is. 
Often we think, oh, Lord, please come quickly. We're waiting for you. No, no, no. God, we are not waiting for God. God is waiting for you. She says Christ is waiting with a longing desire for the church to manifest himself. And then she says, when the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. The word then tells us there is a condition to the coming of Christ. Only when God's people, only when God's church reproduce perfectly that character of love, then he will come to claim them as his own. Christ will come only when we get serious about this message of righteousness by faith. So, so, we, so now we know Christ could have come. In fact, we're told that it, if our church had accepted the message, Christ would have come within two years. In fact, in the year 1888, Congress was about to pass a national Sunday law. Final events were, 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 were being, they were happening back in the 1880s. But they had to go on pause. Why? Because God's church, God's church said no. And because God's church said no, the very person who gave the message to the church, A.T. Jones, had to go to Congress, stand on the floor of Congress and debate among congressmen the Blair Bill, which was simply a national Sunday law which would have been passed. And we are told that angels accompanied A.T. Jones there, and he was able to have the bill not postponed, but have the bill gone, done away with. And we're waiting for the time. You know, we often talk about the time one day when America will enforce Sunday observance. Yeah, it's coming, but only when God's church gets serious first about our message, the message of 1888. So what is this message? This message of righteousness by faith. In brief, number one, sola fide, sola grati, simply Salvation by faith, salvation by grace alone. Point two, it ensures victory over sin, over every sin, all sin. Number three, it ensures the perfection of Christian character. Number four, its importance of the cleansing of the sanctuary on earth as it is in heaven. Number five, it ensures the ability to stand after probation closes. And number six, it bids you to look to Christ as the only avenue of safety in these last days. Those who stand at the very end, those who stand with no intercessor after the close of probation are described as the 144,000. They are those who are living in the time period when Christ had already left the sanctuary and he's on his way to earth. There's no high priest, which means God's people will not be sinning, which means their characters would have been perfected. Are you with me? Perfected character. They have been sealed. Now, I want to spend some time talking about the sealing, the sealing work. Let's turn to Revelation 14 and look at a description of the 144,000. Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. The Bible here describes the 144,000. Notice, verse 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their what? In their foreheads. So John looks and sees the 144,000 standing with the lamb. Now question, who is the lamb? That is Christ, isn't it? It's Jesus. And the 144,000 are standing with the Lamb on Mount Sion. Now, Mount Sion, or Mount Zion, they're used interchangeably, signifies the Holy Mount of Israel. What was on the Holy Mount of Israel? What was on Mount Zion? It was the Holy Temple. And what was in the Holy Temple? The Holy Place. And what was in the Holy Place? The Most Holy Place. 
And what was in the most holy place? The holy ark. And in the holy ark, the holy law. And in the holy law, the one commandment that calls God holy. The Sabbath. The 144,000 are those who have followed the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Wherever he goes, they have followed the Lamb. And they're standing with him there on Mount Zion in the heavenly sanctuary. They have followed the Lamb into the most holy place. They've experienced present truth. Not only that, but the Bible says that, that they have the Father's name. What? Written in their foreheads. Now notice, the Father's name is not stamped on their foreheads. It's written on their foreheads. Now question, is there a difference between a stamp and writing? Yeah, absolutely. A stamp happens one time. Whole thing's done. Writing is a process, isn't it? It takes time to write something. You see, the false gospel being taught in the world today is that God simply stamps you. You're good to go. Once saved, always saved. The sealing work is a stamp. But the gospel taught in the Bible, the gospel taught in the Word of God says no. God is writing His name in your forehead. It's a process. This is why the Bible says that sanctification is a work of a lifetime. It's a process for God to write His name on their foreheads. Not only that, but, but when you write on someone's forehead, it hurts. It hurts. As God is writing His character in the hearts and minds of the last day people, the 144,000, they will experience pain. But the good news is God does not cut like a butcher to kill. God instead cuts like a surgeon to heal. What do you say, amen? It hurts. But in the end, it brings perfection. It brings healing. The 144,000 are those who have been healed fully and completely from the nasty disease called sin. They've had the heart transplant. They've allowed Christ to work in and through them. They've, they've, they've let God do His work in them. They, the 144,000. Now, not only that, but notice it says here that, that they have something on them. I want to read this quote from Ellen White. Acts of the Apostles, page 591. She says, The vision of the prophet pictures as standing on Mount Zion, girt for holy service, clothed with white linen, which is the righteousness of the saints. So the 144,000 are clothed with this white robe, this white linen. Now we're told the white linen is what? The righteousness of the saints. Now, how do we attain this righteousness? How do we have, how do we wear this holy robe? Does God just put it on us? How does that take place? Well, turn now to Zechariah. Zechariah, it's, it's a minor prophet. Ze Zechariah chapter 3, verses 3 through 4. Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and then Zechari Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and then Malachi. So Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 4. Here the prophet is in vision. And he says in verse um, 3, Now Joshua was clothed with what? A filthy garment. Was it a pure white linen? No, it was a filthy garment. And he stood before the angel. Verse 4. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. God not only clothes the sinner, God first removes 
the filthy garments of our own character and then gives us his character. The gospel taught by the world is that we keep our filthy character and God just covers you with his. That is the evangelical gospel. God covers you. No, no, no. The gospel taught in the Bible is God first removes your dirty robe and then clothes you with his spotless robe. That's the gospel. It's a removing of sin from the life. It's a removing from our own will and giving our full will into his hands. Doing exactly what God would want us to do. But once again, we still face the problem with those in our church who say, well, that's impossible. It can't happen. Well, as we close, I want to share a story about the possibility of God. You know, for a while, God's remnant, Israel, had to worship God. But yet, years go by, and Israel now begins to worship this false god named Baal. And because of their rebellion and false worship, God had let Israel fall into the hands of the Midianites. And the Midianites stole their sheep, their cattle, their women, their children, destroyed all their crops. They completely destroyed God's people. It got so bad that many Israelites went to hide in caves just to get away from, from the Midianites. At this point in, in captivity, of course, as they always do, Israel then turns to God and says, God, help us. Why are we in this predicament? God, help us. And the Bible says that the angel of the Lord, which is Christ, by the way, appeared to a man named Gideon. Y'all know the story now, Gideon? The angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon as he was threshing some wheat in the wine press, trying to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord Christ looked like a man, the Bible says, and Gideon thought he was just a normal man. And the man told Gideon, the Lord is with you, O brave man. And Gideon told this angel, if the Lord is with us, then why are all these things happening to us? Then Christ said unto Gideon, go with all your strength and save the Israelites from the Midianites. I myself am with you. Oh, beloved, God tells us the exact same thing today. We are in captivity to sin captivity to Babylon, and God says, go with all your might and save my people from their sin. And so Gideon began to realize who, who he was talking to at this point. And Gideon told this <clears throat> angel of the Lord, if you are pleased with me, give me some proof that you really are the Lord. And stay here while I go and get a food offering. You see, Back then, they would always offer things to God as, as thankfulness. And so he said, stay here. I'm going to run home and get you a food offering. And so Gideon comes back with a loaf of bread. And the angel of the Lord said, Gideon, put that bread on the rock. And the angel of the Lord touched the bread with his stick that was in his hand. And the Bible says, fire came down and consumed the bread which means God had accepted this offering. And immediately, the Bible says, the angel of the Lord vanished, disappeared. And Gideon was afraid, and he exclaimed, I have seen the Lord of hosts face to face. That night, God appeared again to Gideon, not physically this time, but in vision. And he told Gideon, Gideon, go into your father's house and tear down the altars of Baal. The very next morning, Gideon goes into the worship place and tears down the altars erected by his own father to Baal. And the people saw him do it and told his father, King Joash, bring Gideon out so we can kill him. Very serious. I mean, the, the, the story is starting to thick here, isn't it? At this time, the Midianites were coming into Israel to check up on things. And the Bible then says that the Holy Spirit descends upon Gideon and he began to call for an army to defeat the Midianites. 
And we are told that about 32,000 men gathered and came to Gideon ready for battle. About 32,000. That's a lot of men. And so Gideon told his men, or, well, first God told Gideon, Gideon, you, you have too many men. 32,000. No, Gideon, you have too many men. And so God says, Gideon, I will separate them. Bring them down by the river. Have them drink some water. And watch the way they drink. The way they drink will tell you if they are fit for battle or not. And so he brings them down to the river. And the Bible says that 22,000 men out of the 32,000 dunk their whole head and drink like a pig. But 10,000 drink attentively, scooping on the lookout for the enemy that might be coming. And so God tells Gideon, send the 22,000 men home. I don't need them. And so Gideon now is left with 10,000 men. Now, mind you, Gideon has to face an army with thousands of people, okay? And here God has left him with just 10,000 men. Just 10,000 men. Amazing. Amazing. At this point, Gideon was afraid and probably wondering what in the world is, is, is going to happen. Well, not only that, but the plot actually gets thicker. God actually narrows it down again to the point where Gideon is left with fewer men. 300 men. Out of 32,000, Gideon is now left with 300 men. And God spoke to him that night and said, Gideon, I will give you victory in battle. And the next morning, he, he, he woke up, told his men, get up. God will give you the victory over the Midianites. And Gideon then prepped his men for battle. That night, they, they followed the orders of Gideon. They surrounded the army of, of the Midianites, blew their trumpets, and the Bible says that the Midianites woke up with confusion and began to slay each other. What a wonderful God we serve. We did not even have to touch the enemy. They began to slay themselves. If we just listen to God's command. That's all it takes. <clears throat> Listening to God's command. A small remnant of Israel followed God and was triumphant. A small group of believers followed God, though it seemed insane to fight an army of 135,000 with only 300. Though it seemed impossible and insane, God still won the victory. Amen? What a wonderful God. And God promises that same victory to each and every one of us today. We can have the victory over the enemy. We can have the victory over sin. And in these last days, with a small remnant movement, God will again do the impossible and refute those lies of Satan and have his people overcome sin fully and completely, simply allowing God to do his work of eradication. Now notice what, what Ellen White says in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 553. We're almost done. She says, The Lord can work most effectually through those who are most sensible of their own insufficiency, who will rely upon Him as their leader and source of strength. He will make them strong by uniting their weakness to His might and wise by connecting their ignorance to his wisdom. There are too many of us today who know what the mouth of the Lord has spoken, yet we live our lives denying the very power thereof. Why do I have to live this way, Lord? Why do I have to eat this way? Why do I have to dress this way and talk this way and act this way? Why, 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 Lord? God is about to do his final work on earth. But there are too many of us 
who want to be called Adventists, but like, but like Israel, still want to worship Baal. And God is saying, that's not going to work. I need full commitment. I need absolute commitment. We still, we still want to be called Seventh-day Adventists, but still want to worship the sports programs of the world, still want to watch the movies of Hollywood, still want to eat unhealthy food, still want to, the whole money of the world, still want to dress like the world, still want to engage in worldly relationships and unsanctified marriages. We still want to be called Adventists, but still want to worship Baal. Beloved, that's the problem. Ellen White says, she continues in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 554, he is just as willing to work with the efforts of his people now and to accomplish great things through weak instrumentalities. All heaven, she says, this is beautiful, all heaven awaits our demand upon its wisdom and strength. God is promising victory. And beloved, I, I want to be fully surrendered to God so that he can use me as one of those who can finish earth's work. What do you say, amen? It should be your desire for God to use you in the advancement of his kingdom, in the finishing, in the closing work of earth's history. Israel. You know, we often talk about Christ's role as, as high priest in the sanctuary. And you know, his role is pivotal to our overcoming in these last days. We often talk about Christ there in the sanctuary, but what does all that really mean? What does it mean for him to be a high priest? What does it mean to have this day of atonement, this confessing and cleansing? You see, during this time in Israel, on atonement, the Israelites were in solitude with God. In the same way, beloved, during this time of the antitypical day of atonement, 2018, we are living in atonement period. We ought to engage in solitude with God, just like Israel was on that one day out of the year, realizing that we are living in the time of judgment. Judgment is currently taking place. Since 1844, we are living in this time of judgment, and the blotting out of sin is taking place there in the most holy place. But I want you to realize what Christ says regarding his will and his work. When Christ gives his, his famous Lord's Prayer, what is it? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and then what? Thy will be done where? On earth as it is where? In heaven. Do you realize that we are to mirror to copy the work that is currently taking place in heaven. So what's happening in heaven? Well, right now, sin is being blotted out from the most holy place. Well, the exact same work is to take place here on earth. And you ask how? Sin is to be blotted out of the most holy places of humanity, the heart and the mind. We ought to mirror the role of Christ in heaven. Blotting sin out? Well, God wishes to blot sin from our lives out. We are the sanctuary. We are the people that make up God's temple. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? We are the sanctuary. Yes, there is a sanctuary in heaven. Yes, Christ is there blotting literal sin out of a sanctuary in heaven. But more importantly, he is focused on you and I wanting to blot sin out of our lives. That is the blotting out of sin's work to remove sin from our lives. Do you realize that the work here on earth is to exactly copy what's going on there in heaven? Beloved, we are the temple. And in such times like these, 
we need a Savior. What do you say, amen? In times like these, we need God to change our nature. Our nature is bent towards sin. Our nature is a sinful nature. But here's the good news. God offers for us to become partakers of the divine nature. I call it God's DNA. His DNA. His divine nature attributes. God wants to give us His DNA, His divine nature attributes. Why? Because when we have His DNA, guess what? The work will close, Christ will come, and we won't be here anymore. Ellen White says, Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 943. As we partake of the divine nature, hereditary and cultivated tendencies to wrong are cut away from the character. And we are made a living power for good, ever learning of the divine teacher, daily partaking of his nature. We cooperate with God in overcoming Satan's temptations. Beloved, the church militant are those who are professed followers, but the church triumphant are those who have had an experience with Christ. They are those who have allowed Christ to write on them his name. We are the church militant. We are professed followers of Christ. But only God knows who among us will be the church triumphant. The 144,000. Those who have allowed God to do his work. But from now until then, we will see horrible things happen in the world. And very scary things happen in this church because the dragon is indeed wroth with the woman. We see Satan trying to hinder God's people from becoming this church triumphant. Disunity among God's church today. This ordination crisis. This rebellious unions and divisions in the world church. This controversy over Christ's humanity, this nature of Christ. Those who are claiming that Christ is not God and that, and that there is no Holy Spirit. This identity of Daniel 11 and the very controversial subjects of prophecy. Smoke screens, distractions, because Satan does not want us to be a part of the church triumphant. The 144,000, those who receive that seal in the last days of Earth's history. Beloved, God sent 12 spies. As we close, God sent 12 spies into the land, flowing of milk and honey, the promised land. And they were to go in and give a report. When the 12 spies came back, 10 of them said, no, we can't do it. We can't do it. It's impossible. But there were two spies who said, you know what? We serve a God who's bigger than the than those giants. We can conquer. We can go into the promised land. Beloved, the minority today is saying we can do it. We can overcome. Let's go for it. But the majority in the world today, and sad to say, the majority in Adventism is saying, like those 10 spies, we can't do it. We can't do it. God is calling for Joshua's and Caleb's, those two faithful spies who put their trust in the Lord's strength and says, we can overcome. We can conquer. We can do the work that God wants us to do. Oh, how Christ desperately wants to come. God is waiting on us. He is waiting on us to see if we will allow him to do his work, which he so desperately wants to do in each and every one of us. And that is, the writing of his name in our foreheads. Will you allow God to do that work? Will you, will you allow God to write his name, his character, his glory in your forehead, in your mind, in your heart? This is the sealing work of God's people that must take place for Christ to come. I want Christ to come. And, I'm, I, and I commit to allowing Christ day by day, moment by moment, to write his name on my forehead. How about you? Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for your truth. Lord, 
we know that a time is coming, a shaking is coming, a draining of the swamp is coming, Lord, in your church. And only those who are firm, firmly planted upon Christ and his truth and those who are sealed will be able to stand, Lord. So I ask that you seal each person here, Lord, that you make them willing for you to write your name on their forehead, to seal them unto your coming, Lord. And bless us now as we dismiss from this place. Help us, to keep, help us to keep Christ as a focus and never to lose sight of him is our prayer in his name. In Jesus' name, amen.